Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to examine the concept of sustainability as it relates to urban development. Traditionally, urban planners utilized zoning laws to influence how cities develop. Zoning laws are laws that dictate how land can be used. Areas are usually divided into separate zones of residential, retail, or industrial use. These ordinances govern land use and were usually separated into single use zones, but this contributed to urban sprawl as cities grew. In turn, this led to more pollution and a larger ecological footprint. So modern day urban planners tend to emphasize compact and walkable cities, which makes cities both environmentally friendly and welcoming to diverse communities. Mixed use development or MUD is one way to limit urban sprawl and promote more compact cities. Mixed use development is a single plan development designed to include multiple uses, such as residential, retail, educational, recreational, industrial, and office spaces. Mixed use development means that your home is on the same block as the grocery store and your office and the park and so on. In short, you'll have residential, commercial, recreational, industrial, office spaces, all in the same area rather than spread out. And it may actually be in the same building with retail and commercial activities on the ground floor with offices and apartments on higher floors. This means that communities will be more compact with higher population densities. And mixed use development helps to promote what is called walkability which is the idea that areas are safe, convenient, and efficient for pedestrians and cyclists, as well as, or instead of, cars. And mixed use communities try to minimize the need to travel outside the community. But in our increasingly complex cities, it's quite difficult. So urban planners will build these higher density, walkable, mixed use communities around or near a mass transit station, a concept called transportation oriented development. So if you need to leave the community for work, shopping, or any other reason, you can reliably use mass transit, thereby minimizing the use of fossil fuels and reducing urban pollution. So as it exists right now, creating more walkable neighborhoods with mixed use development and reliable mass transit is the most sustainable form of urban living because it reduces the need for personal automobiles. To provide some comparison, European cities tend to be designed in a more sustainable way because many of them were built prior to the invention of personal automobiles. In France, for example, each person produces 4.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide. In Denmark, it's 5.9 metric tons. Germany is 8.9 metric tons. But in the United States, each person produces 16.5 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. So let's look at some specific design ideas that incorporate the fundamentals of urban sustainability. Make sure that you're prepared to talk about more broad concepts of urban sustainability, like walkability or mixed use development, as well as the more specific concepts that we're about to discuss. Smart growth is the term applied to the collective group of policies that promote urban sustainability by combating sprawl through compact, walkable, mixed-use, transportation-oriented, high-density communities. Smart growth policies also aim to protect rural farmland, 
as urban communities will be more compact and denser. They encourage more intensive use of urban land by building up with taller buildings of mixed use design rather than building out and further contributing to urban sprawl. This is accomplished by changing zoning laws to increase housing density and transition to more mixed land use areas. In addition, incentives can be offered to encourage builders to incorporate mixed use designs. There are several broad categories that fall within the domain of smart growth. Let's start with new urbanism, which is a movement to make cities more livable and to foster a greater sense of community by designing compact, pedestrian-friendly neighborhoods with sidewalks, front porches, and larger variety of housing types and land uses. New urbanism is an approach to create more European-style cities with higher population densities and greater walkability. New urbanism arose in response to the sprawling, automobile-centered cities. There's a strong focus on preserving and promoting the character of communities by protecting historic buildings and developing attractive architecture. There would be a variety of homes surrounding a central park. The communities would utilize mixed land uses with most amenities like shopping, dining, and entertainment being within a 10 minute walk of either home or work. New urbanism favors diversity of both housing and income levels so that all members of the community can interact together. High quality public transportation would link new urbanist communities without promoting urban sprawl and thereby reducing the amount of time and energy that's spent on personal vehicles. The Congress for New Urbanism believes that these changes would help to promote a high quality of life for both residents and businesses. There are a number of examples around the world. Curitiba in Brazil, Celebration Florida, and Freiburg in Germany have all utilized new urbanist ideas to promote urban sustainability. Curitiba turned a garbage dump into a botanical garden, while Freiburg protected historic buildings and limited traffic in the city center to encourage social interaction. Another smart growth concept is the inclusion of green belts. A green belt is a ring of land maintained as parks, agriculture, or other types of open space to limit the sprawl of an urban area. This limits pollution, promotes plant growth, even local agriculture, as well as protecting habitats for wildlife. So let's jump straight to some examples. Probably the most prominent example of a green belt is the one surrounding London in the United Kingdom. It began in 1938 to limit the spread of the metro area, and it now encompasses one point. 2 million acres of land. U.S. states like Oregon, Washington, and Tennessee require their largest cities to plan green belts, as do the cities of Ottawa, Toronto, and Vancouver in Canada, and larger cities in Australia, New Zealand, and Sweden have also incorporated green belts into their urban planning. Finally, Slow growth cities are cities that have actively tried to decrease the rate at which their cities grow. Boulder, Colorado has established an urban growth boundary that limits how fast the city spreads horizontally. They have done this by restricting the number of new building permits. The slow growth approach is especially helpful for cities that have limited resources and may be concerned that infrastructure and city services could be overwhelmed by new construction. In Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, officials limited growth to specific areas. 
They wanted to preserve historic areas and the rural landscape that's home to long-standing Amish and Mennonite communities. So they permanently protected 82,000 acres of farmland, along with roughly 6,000 acres of parks. So now that we have the details and some examples, let's talk about the potential benefits and criticisms of these approaches. Perhaps the biggest benefit and the ultimate goal of urban sustainability is the slowing of urban sprawl, thereby reducing air pollution by reducing automobile traffic and fuel consumption. This can improve the health of the community because they'll be getting more exercise, which can increase life expectancy and reduce healthcare costs. But there will also be fewer traffic accidents because we won't be driving as much. For example, the transit-oriented communities near Washington, D.C.'s Metro Line see 40% of residents taking public transportation to work, while 6% walk. That's nearly half of the community using something other than a car. By promoting income diversity, that is, having houses for high-income as well as low-income families, the city builds a strong economic base that can be used to provide high quality services and transportation infrastructure. It also encourages social interaction across groups, which can create a sense of community and strengthen social identity. By increasing population density and the intensiveness of land use, more buildings will be occupied and there will be less vacant land and advocates believe that this can reduce crime. Green belts preserve farmland and protect the environment. In fact, within the Ontario Green Belt, there are 5,500 farms which add more than $9 billion to Ontario's economy, provide 161,000 jobs, and save the province billions of dollars a year by providing clean drinking water and removing millions of pounds of pollutants from the air. All this adds up to more sustainable and more livable cities. Livability is the sum of the factors that add up to a community's quality of life, including the built and natural environments, economic prosperity, social stability and equity, and educational, cultural, and entertainment opportunities. Sustainable cities reduce a city's ecological footprint while enhancing its residents' quality of life. Sustainability saves people money while creating economically viable areas that people enjoy living in. But that isn't the whole story. Many of the benefits we just talked about are the stated goals of urban sustainability. But there are other consequences of urban sustainability that aren't as positive. While new urbanism states that it desires mixed income and diverse communities, those goals are often not realized. By creating desirable new communities, real estate prices go up and the lowest income families are priced out. And by limiting the size of communities, it limits the ability to add more housing units that would bring down housing costs. And when lower income people of color are unable to afford living in these communities, it creates what is called de facto segregation. This is racial segregation that isn't prescribed by law, but is still apparent nonetheless. For example, Providence, Rhode Island began to redesign its downtown using sustainable principles, but income and ethnic diversity were the hardest goals to accomplish because they could not guarantee affordability. Another primary criticism of sustainable redevelopment is that it can lead to the loss of historical character. Some have argued that new urbanism's architecture removes the unique qualities 
that give a neighborhood its unique sense of place. And while new urbanism desires unique architecture, the community in Celebration Florida has been criticized as looking more like a movie set than a real town. Others are concerned with rising crime or the loss of privacy. Some are concerned that quiet suburban living will become noisy and fast paced. The reality is that these movements are experiments in progress. Some will be successful and others won't. But the general consensus is that the current pattern of automobile centered suburban sprawl cannot continue unabated. And we will look at some of the challenges to urban sustainability in a future lecture. Have a good night, everyone, and I'll see you back in class.